Welcome to Lacey's Lineup. Off-season episodes are just heating up, and I am back with another exciting guest, former Tennessee Titans linebacker Peter Sermon. It is going to be an exciting episode, so let's not waste any more time and welcome Peter to the show. Lacey's Lineup kicks off right now. Hey, Peter. Thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate you being here. No, thanks for having me, Lacey. Yeah. So I have so many questions and I'm so excited to hear all your answers, but let's just start back from the beginning. What started your love of football? Well, I feel like this uh, conversation is going to make me play rewind a lot. So there might be some pauses here on, on getting back to the archives in my head. <laughs> uh, you know, looking back on football, football, uh, I was the youngest of uh, four boys. Uh, in my family, my oldest brother is 10 years older than me than I have a seven year old, uh, older and then three years old, uh, three years older than me. So as the, as the youngest in the family, I was, you know, there's a lot of travel, uh, to support, uh, my other brothers, my older brothers, a lot of different sports from ice hockey to, to baseball to obviously football. Um, so football just kind of was one of those that, that I, just kind of thought I was going to sign up for it. Uh, and I, I started in seventh, yeah, seventh grade in middle school and uh, didn't really know much about it, but I'd watch my, uh, my brothers do it. And I figured if they can do it, I could probably do it as well. Um, and, you know, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I, I wouldn't say I loved it. Um, but, you know, as, as I played it more, I think I got a little more comfortable with it and, and uh, with it some success and then some identity. That's awesome. So did you play any other sports or was football just kind of the one that you signed up for? No, we did a bunch. We were encouraged by my folks uh, to do a lot. So uh, I got uh, into ice hockey at the age of three and oh. I played that all the way up, I think, till about my 17th birthday. So that was something that was very um, consistent um, every winter growing up. Uh, I dabbled in basketball in middle school and in uh, elementary school and in baseball as well. Uh, I was on the high school golf team my freshman and sophomore year. Um, my freshman and sophomore year, I did not look like a football player. So uh, my, my parents encouraged me to get into golf. And then in my last two years of high school in the spring, I participated in uh, ran track. Oh, wow. So you've kind of done it all. Definitely. Yeah. And, and, you know, kind of reflecting back on it, I think, uh, I'm, I'm very glad that that's the way it was, um, for me. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't specialized. Uh, and I'm actually quite, I don't know, I would say maybe just maybe fortunate that I was okay at football, but I was never really good at football, um, until later in high school, which I think played, uh, a huge amount or had a huge influence on, how I looked at football and how I prepared for football and the, the identity that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it wasn't something that I was wrapped up in growing up. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. I see uh, a ton of uh, young players that I recruit now. And I've been at uh, some really good schools that that uh, you, you could go recruit uh, the kids that are uh, the very, very best all the way from, you know, from Pop Warner all the way up to up to college. And I think there's a um, there's a burden that uh, that, you know, comes along with always being the most talented. Yeah, I agree. Just from me, I played volleyball and basketball growing up, but I felt like it was always good because you could pull certain skills from each one to make it better. And I didn't start volleyball till later in life. And that's actually the one that I stuck with and excelled at. But it wasn't something that I started so early. So it was nice to kind of grow into that sport. It is. And, and uh, hopefully that, uh, you know, coaches, you know, I think they're the, the, the main drivers uh, that the, the youth coaches or the um, all-star or the AAU coaches um, find uh, maybe some common ground with, with some of the uh with some of the other sports that allow kids to, to dabble in multiple sports and not have to become so, so focused so early. Yeah, exactly. 
So you obviously were a linebacker. Was that something you always were? Did you switch into it? Or how did you become into that position? Yeah, you know, I played, uh, I think I might have played linebacker maybe in seventh and eighth grade a little bit, but I don't really even recall what I did. Um, I remember where I did it, but I don't really remember the positions. Uh, And then I played quarterback and free safety in high school. So I never played linebacker in high school. Um, And the the recruiting process was a projection uh, that I was going to change positions, uh, partly because uh, I was a athletic quarterback, but I couldn't I couldn't throw it as well as uh, college quarterbacks. Um, and my stature just kind of led me to uh, what that's that that natural progression was going to be. Oh wow, that's nice. So you went from offense to defense. Yeah, I played uh, I played both ways again, which is uh, uh, another thing that um, you know you don't see a ton of it. Um, you know, but I was I grew up in Walla Walla, Washington, so uh, we had one public and one private high school. Um, in our, our public high school, I th- think I'd had 15, 1,600 kids in it. So it wasn't tiny, um, but it, it wasn't also so large that, um, that you know, you were a, a two platoon, you know, you only played offense or you only played defense. It's, uh, you know, we had a ton of guys play both ways. And, and uh, you know, if you're one of the better players, then you were going to have to figure out how to stay, um, you know, stay healthy and, and not get tired to play in the games, all the, all the snaps in the games. Yeah, that's great. All right, well, let's move on to now not have to go back so far and talk about <laughs> some of your college experience. I mean, I know you went to Oregon. What made you choose to go there? You know, Lacey, uh, it was a pretty simple, uh, you know, uh, conclusion. It was uh, at the time um, I had been offered by Oregon State University, um, and my brother had been a walk-on there you know, 10 years ago or 10 years prior to me getting the opportunity. Uh, Oregon State wasn't a program that I was super interested in. Um, Then I took an official visit to Washington State University. That's where actually my mom graduated from. And that was a a school that, you know, just, you know, for whatever reason, just, you know, I I didn't see myself as a good fit there. And then uh, the third school that that really pursued me was Oregon. Uh, Went down there. Um, enjoyed my uh, game day visit. So my dad and I uh, drove down there after one of my high school games my senior year. And uh, we really had a a good experience there. Um, And then when I took my official visit, I felt like there were some uh, guys there that shared some similarities in the the atmosphere. And, you know, Eugene, Oregon was quite a bit further. It was about, you know, five and a half, six hours away from where I grew up, where Washington State was um, significantly closer, about two hours from where I grew up. So all those factors has kind of, kind of led me to, you know, I think Oregon was uh, the right fit. And then um, kind of a funny story now that I'm a college coach is uh, how I ended up committing. So uh, Steve Greatwood, who was uh, the offensive line coach at the time. And at that time, for any of your listeners, that they were recruited in the seventies, eighties, nineties, whoever the area recruiter, for that university was, that's who recruited you. You didn't have the position specific. You didn't have your position coach recruiting you. Um, and guys that that were area coaches, they would get to know every high school coach, you know, every uh, parking lot, every uh, practice facility that you might be at. And uh, so I took my trip down to Oregon and I didn't even know what I was supposed to do, quite honestly. Um, I didn't know if I was supposed to commit or what I was supposed to do, but um, the next weekend after my official visit, uh, Steve Greatwood called me in the morning and said, Hey, we have, uh, another linebacker coming in this weekend. Uh, if you want to be here, you're going to need to commit. And there was about oh, a two wow. second pause. And I, <laughs> I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll commit. He's like, what? I said, yeah, sure. Yeah. I want to come. And he's like, oh, 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 Peter, this is going to be amazing. Coach Brooks, I'm going to go tell Coach Brooks. Um, and he is going to be so excited. I want you to stay right by this phone because Rich Brooks wants to call you and congratulate you. This is huge news. So I hung up the phone, and I sat there for about five minutes, and he never called. <laughs> and at the time, I didn't even think it was a big deal. Um, and I just walked away, and I committed. And you know, it didn't matter that he didn't call me. Um, in this environment, if that had happened, 
a, a young man would have thought that he can't go to school there or they didn't really want me or they couldn't accept my commitment or the head coach was supposed to call me and now it's DEFCON 3 and right. you know the world is ending. But such a simpler time, uh, you know, such a different time. Definitely. That's so interesting. It is different how you didn't think much of it, but like you said, I nowadays it, it would be, but congratulations yeah, though, being yeah. in Oregon cool. and all your accomplish- accomplishments there is great. But let's talk about like just a day in the life of being a college athlete at Oregon. Can you take us through a day in season that you had? Yeah. You know, it was a, uh... I mean, I would imagine it's, it's very similar to, to most everybody else's experiences. Uh, you know, I had a, a real good friend group, um, you know, so we, we would live together or kind of be in the same apartment complex. And, uh, you know, it was uh, school in the morning and then you head over to uh, the stadium and you had your weightlifting and uh, position meetings and practice. And then afterwards you'd have training table. Um, you only had training table uh, once a day back then. Now we feed uh, our guys seemingly uh morning noon and night um but it was just a a very um uneventful experience which i think made it all the better it was about friendship it was about team uh, and it was about hanging out there was no uh, there was so few um uh, media sources at the time you had some big ones but not the not the twitter availability um you know not the tiktok not not anything that that fans uh, would ever attack you or criticize you. And, you know, again, just the, the differences that I, I get to see from experiencing it um, personally to now experiencing my players go through it and the amount of passion that the players now um, have to contend with. And passion is probably a um, not a descriptive term of it because passion could be on both sides of it, but um, you know, just the amount of everyday criticism or everyday uh, recognition these guys have, it's, it's, it's a completely different time. It really is. I mean, and technology plays, like you said, a big part of that, right? Like having all that yes. media access. So, well, I'm glad that you enjoyed your time there. But before we move on from college, could you tell me maybe your most memorable game or moment that you had at Oregon playing football? <laughs> Yeah, um, let's. Uh, I would probably take it to, you know, probably nine. I think it was nineteen ninety. It was nineteen ninety seven. Uh, we went up and played uh, the University of Washington, um, and you know, really starting in ninety. I think nineteen ninety four was the year that Oregon ended up. Uh, beating Washington at home that kind of propelled them in going to the Rose Bowl, the 95 Rose Bowl where they played Penn State, which as a as a uh, Oregon Duck, I would kind of say that that Rose Bowl from now, from there on was kind of the modern era of, of Oregon football and how it kind of transitioned and changed. But we went up there and uh, it was still a huge rivalry and the University of Washington was probably still – uh, looking down their nose at Oregon, which now it's a much, much fairer fight, I guess, uh, up there now between both both programs. But, right. um, you know, just went up there and, uh, you know, our whole team played really well. Um, I played well well enough to, to you know, make some definite contributions to the team and, and to get out there with the win, kind of going back to your home state. Um, you know, University of Washington was a place um, that I had desired to go. And for whatever reason, it didn't work out for them to offer me a scholarship. So it was, uh, you know, it was was, uh, something to go up there and had something to prove. Oh, that's, yeah, that's awesome. And to prove it too. Congratulations on that. That's awesome. All right. So let's kind of talk now at the process of leaving Oregon and, you know, entering into the NFL. Did you declare, how was like that, the process and entering into the draft? Uh, You know, there, it wasn't anything... You know, I really don't even remember if I formally, you know, if I filled out paperwork or something. I don't even know if, if there's a formal declaration. Uh, but I had expired. Uh, I had used all my um, my eligibility. So I redshirted my my first year, and then I used my four years of eligibility. So it was uh, – I just graduated, and it was time to, to move on. Um, in the transition, uh, I had uh, vetted, you know, quite a few um, uh, agents, and most of them were – primarily Northwest uh, or West Coast kind of agents, people that kind of understood 
or you know had some had some prior relations with with uh you know guys at Oregon or guys at Washington or some of the Northwest guys. Uh, so I ended up you know probably vetting you know three or four of them. Uh, very not a, not a super uh, in depth process. Um, and then that's probably kind of how I make a lot of my decisions. It's uh, you take the information you have and, and you get to know the people best you can. And, and then, you, then you just make a pretty fast decision. Then you just kind of keep on moving on. So I don't get, I didn't get caught in the weeds very much making that decision um, and end up just taking somebody that represented me. Um, he helped me out through my entire career. And then uh, I had had the opportunity. Uh, I was invited to go play in the senior bowl. So then I went down to the senior bowl and then I went to the combine. And then after that, just waited for the, for the draft day. That's awesome. And was there a specific team you were hoping to be drafted to and just in the back of your mind? Not at all. I was, (laughs) I was, (laughs) I, I, I I couldn't believe that I was going to keep playing football. And, uh, you know, um, if you had asked me in high school, do you have a dream of playing the NFL? I would probably said no. Um, it was, you know, we had one uh, one really, really talented football player uh, in Walla Walla. His name was Drew Bledsoe. Ended up being the number one pick in the draft from Washington State. So yes. that was really my uh, only uh, knowledge of the NFL or that people could do it from, uh, you know, a smaller community in eastern Washington. It wasn't something that you grow up talking about. You don't grow up the Metroplex and, and you're talking about the Cowboys, uh, you know. Right. Eastern Washington, you're five hours from Seattle, um, and that's the nearest pro team. And the next, I guess, nearest pro team would be San Francisco in the Bay. So, it, or Oakland at the time as well. Um, but yes. they've all it switched really around now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. What were the LA Raiders maybe at that time? Right. Um, but it, it was, uh, it wasn't anything that, that the community kind of lived and, and breathed. It was, it was uh, something people talked about, but it wasn't anything that I remember any of my friends um, growing up in middle school or high school ever say, hey, one day I'm going to make it to the NFL. Um, so that was, you know, so I didn't really have a, a favorite Same. team or a, or a favorite location. And then, you know, I didn't know enough about America, even though where the good spots or the, or the not so good <laughs> spots were. Right. But you did get drafted by the Tennessee Titans. So kind of take me through that emotions, though, when you, you know, when you get that call that you're going to be a Titan? Well, it was, uh, it was pretty, it, it was pretty exciting. Um, now I had a big weekend that weekend. Um, so my son was born on April 15th. Um, and I was drafted on April 16th. Oh, that is a so, big weekend. <laughs> so I had, uh, I had given, uh, every team that I met with at the combine and my agent had given my, uh, apartment, cell phone or not my cell phone, my apartment phone number. Cause I didn't have a cell phone. I was married, just been married to my wife, Lindsay for, I mean, shoot, uh, we got married in July. So about eight or nine months. Uh, but I didn't have a cell phone. And if I did, I, I must not have given it to my agent or the NFL. So, uh, when, when Jackson was being born on the 15th, uh, I ha- I was replaying this, like, they're going to call the apartment and no one's going to answer and they're going to select somebody else. I had this, just this, I had this, just this gut wrenching, like, dude, if it, I, I don't know. I mean, cause I don't know how it works and I still don't really know how it works, but you know, if you call and you don't answer, do they just go to the they, next person? Do, <laughs> do they still go to the next one? Uh, so, so uh, in that, uh, in that format, if I remember right, I think the uh, the first three rounds were on Saturday, and then uh, round four through seven was on Sunday. And I was selected uh, in the fourth round, and I had uh, left Lindsay and Jackson at the ho- uh, the hospital because I was like, "Honey, I I want to stay with you, here, but I I really don't want to miss the phone call if somebody <laughs> wants to draft me." So I ended up going home, and then. Uh, it uh, it lasted one round for the fourth round, and then I was selected. And then uh, I really don't recall how fast I got back to Lindsay, but but that was the that was the weekend. Oh, that had to be so exciting, you yeah. know, father and going to the NFL. That's awesome. Yeah. That's that has to be a ton of emotions. Yes. Okay, so you so now you've been drafted. Like, what is the next? Is it training camp, rookie camp? Is that kind of where it goes? 
Yeah, so as soon as you get drafted, I think it was uh, maybe the following weekend you went out there for uh, your mini camp, really your your rookie mini camp, which was going to be the collection of all the draft picks and all the other players that had signed free agent contracts to get out there. Uh, and you started the workouts then. They put you through uh, the off-season conditioning. Uh, you started the meetings and really just started to kind of acclimate and assimilate yourself to the, to the, uh, to the defense, to the program. Um, and really the, the city and everything that kind of went along with, uh, you know, having that uh, be your job. And then I think I was there for probably a month or so. You know, I'm trying to think April 15, I probably went there the next weekend. And I was probably there for, for maybe a month, maybe five weeks. And then after that, uh, came back and then picked up uh, Lindsay and Jack. And then we eventually ended up uh, moving out to Nashville. Uh, yep. Time to yeah, go, right? Summer. Move the family yes. to Nashville. Yes. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about your teammates. Like, how was it? What Was it a huge transition from playing in college? Like, is it faster in the NFL? And kind of how was it, like, with the teammates starting in the uh, rookie? You know, I, I thought the teammates, uh, I thought we had a great group of quality men. And, you know, I could probably say that that's, that's probably the um, the norm is – you know, you hear about some of the the one offs that that sometimes are challenging, but to make it to that level, um, it takes a lot. Now, the first thing is, you know, some of the guys have just um, incredible talent; they're gifted with incredible talent. But to have any duration uh, in that in that league, there has to be some aptitude on some behavior that that keeps you at the top. Because every year, you know, the the this the sheer number of people that are um, that are striving to get to that level it's uh, you're you're constantly fighting for your position knowing that there's somebody younger and cheaper uh, and just as hungry as you were when you first started uh, to be able to to continue to to retain you know your position on the team but uh, you know just from some of the some of the guys that that, that people would know the Eddie Georges uh, you know Steve McNair Bruce Matthews just an incredible um, teammate Hall of Fame. I think he still has the most games ever played consecutively. I think Bruce does. Um, you know, just a lot of uh, a lot of uh, really really talented people, but but great teammates as well. That's awesome. Do you still keep in touch with your old teammates? I don't. Not as well as I should. <laughs> or you know, it's uh, it's one of those things that you know the coaching and then everybody has taken, uh, you know, whatever their path is once they're playing, the days are over. Um, you know, I'm not one for uh, staying socially with, up with people. You know, that's not uh, not my wheelhouse. Yeah, no worries. But I'm sure it was like a brotherhood during your time playing though, right? Yeah, sure. it is. You know, it's a, it's a pretty tight uh, locker room. And then the, the longer you stay there, the fewer people you've had with you the entire time. So the longer you're there, uh, you're always bringing in new people, but that core group of people, um, you know, continues to get smaller and smaller. And I think as you stay longer and longer, you realize how lucky it is to to be anywhere for, you know, any significant amount of time. That's awesome. So what was your favorite game you played in the NFL? Oh, you know, we played uh, several uh, playoff games. You know, I think it was these years are passing me up. Uh, <laughs> Might have been two th- thousand and two or two thousand and three we went up to um gillette and we went on the road and played in the, uh i think the afc divisional game against uh tom brady and that crew and uh i, I remember just being absolutely bone chilling frigid oh yes and uh you know i remember telling uh my wife when i got home is i couldn't wear my mouthpiece that day and she was like, why couldn't you wear your, my mouthpiece? I said, well, it was so cold. As soon as spit got into the indentations of your mouthpiece, it iced up so it wouldn't fit. You couldn't you couldn't cap it back on your teeth again because all the spit in your, uh, in your mouthpiece had frozen. Wow. Uh, and I remember getting back into bed that night. We played on the road up there, and I was still cold. I was still cold, but... It, uh, you know, a bunch of us didn't wear sleeves just because it's a, I don't know, frame of mind type of thing, but you're all lubed up with every kind of, every type of substance you can put on that's not illegal on your, on your arms. We had, remember we had, uh, and I'd never been anywhere that had played that cold, but 
our equipment guys bought brought antiperspirant spray to spray in your arms or any exposed part of your skin because if you can keep the sweat off of your skin, you can keep the cold off your skin. That's interesting. I wouldn't have even thought of that. I know. The stuff you learn when you're going to freeze your ass off. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. As a fan watching, right. You know, you, okay, it's cold and you see like the, everything coming off, but I can only imagine. And then on top of that, getting hit <laughs> while you're that yep. cold. Yeah. I just recently that Kansas city game, I think that's been like coldest game, right? The one yes. where Andy yes. Reeds was literally frozen. Yeah. His his mouthpiece was, yeah <laughs> it, was, it was frozen as well. So those are, uh, those are memorable days. Yes, for sure. Was there a loss that hurt the most during your time? Well, we had uh, we played uh, Rich Gannon out here in Oakland, and that was must have been two thousand three ish, uh, and that was uh, an AFC Championship game. And they ended up going on that next week and playing. That's when uh, John Gruden and Tampa won oh, with yeah. uh, Warren Sapp and that group of guys. Yeah, but uh, you know we were within one game going to Super Bowl, and that was as that was the closest that I personally had. Uh, the opportunity to get with the AFC Championship game played in uh, several wild cards, several uh, division games, but the uh, the conference championship was was the one that yeah, because uh, you know you're closest. like that close, right? <laughs> absolutely, oh. absolutely. Oh. Well, congrats on your career. I mean, everything that you've done is just it's just awesome. So, congratulations on all your accomplishments. Well, I've uh, I've been very fortunate. Um, you know, I think. I think the, the, the timing of things, um, the people that come along in your life that, that kind of help you either navigate or maybe prevent you from going down the wrong path. I think, I think there's a, a, there's a whole list of people that I can, I can think of. And I would, I would give credit to, 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 to get to anywhere of, of high achievement. Yes. Well, there's definitely always somebody there with you, but Okay. Well, so all, after all that, um, after leaving the NFL, you began coaching. Was that something you wanted to do or is that something that kind of presented itself? That, that's something that kind of presented itself after I was done. So uh, I think I submitted my paperwork or uh, the retirement paperwork to the NFL, I think right around my 30th birthday, if I remember right. Um, and that was a, that was a good run for me. Um, I, had, I had finished out my second contract with Tennessee Um you know, and, and I never, I never had the ambition of, of making, making so much money that, that I would be retired from doing anything else. Um, and a lot of guys, you know, and this is, you know, personal preference and what people do, but I enjoy working. Uh, I don't know what I would do or what kind of example I would have been to my kids. Um, had they seen that their dad never worked a day in his life prior to knowing him. Uh, so that was something that, that uh, I was ready to, to transition. Now the transition didn't go right into the, into uh, coaching. So I think about two weeks after I retired, I uh, ended up getting my uh, residential real estate license in Nashville there. Um, and this is right around 2007, 2008. So anybody that's old enough or was an adult during 2007, 2008, the last thing you probably wanted to be in was probably real estate for your job. Uh, so that that right. was one of those, you know. I guess based on kind of the the uh, atmosphere at the time of what that was going to be like, um, and the kind of some of the uncertainty, and then really realizing what it meant to be a, a real estate agent for me. That's something that probably wasn't going to uh, drive me every day. Um, so I think there could have been some other avenues in that in that space, but just the the real estate agent was something that that wasn't going to be my long-term play. Um, so I did that for, uh, I think about a, almost a full, a full year. Um, and then the kind of the itch to, to get back into the football world, um, pre not presented, but kind of revealed itself. Right. And then from there, I, um, I called all the contacts I had, um, in college and there was basically every door that I thought could open didn't. Um, so it was very, uh, frustrating, uh, but thankfully I ended up, uh, I was offered a volunteer job at a division two school at, uh, central Washington university. And the only reason I got offered that job is the head coach at the time actually grew up down the street from my family in Walla Walla. So there was, there was familiarity. 
Oh, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I mean, shoot, Even bounced around. I saw, yeah, mm-hmm. Mississippi yeah. State, I believe, right, Louis? Yeah, so uh, after Central Washington, went to University of Oregon and GA'd for a year. Then I went to University of Tennessee, GA'd for a year. Then I got hired on as the inside linebacker coach there. And then uh, then I left and went to two years at the University of Washington. Uh, and then another two years at uh, Southern California, USC. And then I uh, left SC and went to Mississippi State. Uh, and then went to Louisville, and now uh, I'm out here at uh, University of California, Berkeley. Just finished up my sixth year, heading into my year seven here. That's awesome. And you were able to coach your son this year, correct? I was. So the last two years, uh, Jack and I um, were able to work together. So out of high school, uh, I was at Louisville, and uh, he wasn't interested in attending Louisville. He uh, chose University of Washington. And then uh, he spent four years up there, uh, and then he graduated. So that was really just the year before the um, the transfer portal just went kind of um, wide open. So he had to be a grad a graduate to transfer to not have to sit out. So he was a, a grad transfer, and then uh, the last two seasons, uh, Jack played for me. That's awesome. That has to be a fun fun time being able to coach with your son. And I heard it's he great did to have a him. great yep. job too. Him yeah, as he's well. a, he was a yeah he's a uh, he's a talented uh, player and he's a extremely hard worker and and uh, you know exemplifies all the things you'd love to see in uh, in a player from a, from a coaching perspective and he's a good kid. From, That's from, awesome, you know, my son. Yeah. Right. So does it differ being a, like is it differ being a coach compared to a player now that you see both sides of it? It it, it couldn't be any more different. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're participating and you're kind of in that same, um, you're in that same comp, you know, competitive environment, but, uh, the, the things that you consider and you take time to, to, you know, work through as a coach are significantly different than we did as a player. As a player, um, I can still remember, you know, everybody referring to themselves as independent contractors right. in that locker room in the NFL, everybody's a, a collection and everybody's putting, um, you know, whatever's best for them uh, while pushing forward um, for what the overall objective of the team is. But, you know, it's all about taking care of yourself. You're not overly concerned with the other side of the ball. <clears throat> you know, it's uh, you kind of you focus and, and you put your your time and effort into things that you can control. And that's usually you and maybe one or two people in your position. Other than that, you got a, a group of grown ass men. And everybody needs to do their own job. Uh, but the the coaching side, it's it's all about how can we utilize all these different skills and abilities and have them come together. Because as a coach, you're all about one thing, and that's the that's the product on the field. As a player, you're all about your own personal accountability, and that was my experience. That is true. You're worried about yeah. That I like that. I like hearing that. Um, now I know that you've continued on and your career is still in the game that you played, but is there times where you do miss playing? No, no, there's really not. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I, if I look back on it, uh, there might be times that I, uh, that I miss the camaraderie that went with all the other parts of it. Uh, but you know, the amount of time and effort, um, uh, and the, the, consistency that is required to play at that level. I don't, I don't miss, um, I don't miss all the, the hundred percent of, of the time and the effort to be able to go out there and, and play at a high level and, and play to help your team win. Right. Well, that's good. Well, it's fun still to be a coach though. Definitely playing in the football. Football is a great sport and I think it continues to uh, attract some of the very best competitors that we have obviously the the fan bases uh, haven't probably ever been as passionate as they are now and i think it's uh the transfer portal the nil um the bowl games the the combine on tv you know all the all the different things that are now associated with college and nfl there's just so much content and people seemingly uh just love it and, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to be around, uh, be around it as well. And there's some, there's some challenging parts, uh, but I'd say 98% of, of football is, is just a blessing. It really is. I mean, you can see it, it's a huge passion for me. I never obviously got to play the game, but I love it. I love talking about it. And that's one of the reasons I started this podcast. So yeah, that's great. I mean, there's so many, there's so many different ways for people to be involved. Yeah. You know, I think that's a great thing about the sport as well. And I am a diehard Dallas Cowboy fan. (laughs) 
you probably had no choice. I, That's all right. Yeah, I was born into it, but yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. We've yes. been frustrated for a long time. <laughs> but let's kind of move yes. on before you guys, or before I let you go, uh, just a little talk about the current NFL season. Like, what did you think of the 23-24 season? Your kind of your thoughts on it. You know, I, th- I, th- I still think, uh, you know, the NFL and um, you know, the way the, the owners have set it up, boy, it's become so uh, QB centric that, you know, the 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 value uh, of finding uh, an elite quarterback, I, I still think is is paramount. Um, you know, you can continue to build with with very talented defenses, but uh, the rules, um, the way that the, the quarterbacks protected, the way they protect the skill players, um, you know, is such a um, an offensive uh, minded uh, product that uh, you don't, you just kind of see that that continual level, and then this the the quality of play, really at, on both sides of the ball. Um, you know, there was it was years ago that they uh, renegotiated the the CBA, the collective bargaining agreement, which which implemented some pretty radical changes in the off season program. Some of the stipulations on when guys can be there. Uh, limited the amount of time uh, in the facility and limited the amount of, of the types of practices you could have. Uh, and I really thought at the time that could be um, a deterrent in, in the quality of the product. But boy, um, that is not the case. These guys are throwing and catching uh, better than they ever have. They really, really are. Um, it definitely is. a, a From a defensive side, though, do you feel like they aren't they aren't as defensive minded when it comes to the penalties. <laughs> Are they not letting them play anymore? Well, I, I think it's I think it's different. It's just different with you know, and that's a you know not a I don't mean that in a in a you know to brush it off, but you know I I would personally I would get on my I don't know, my podium. I still I think I think there needs to be. You know, as the rules have changed, the style of play has changed. I think there needs to be uh, a before and an after um, of when the quarterbacks have been protected. Because the prior, you know, really up in the early 2000s, uh, there was virtually minimal, there was minimal protection for the quarterback position. And you saw the, the great quarterbacks, they were, they were a different style of athlete overall overall than they than they are now they were typically larger you know built right. more because of you know they had to get i mean they had to take hits now um and the receivers they were built with a little more durability bigger men um because you you could hit them when they went across the middle um and it wasn't a penalty on on the defense so i think those those types of those types of um players it's you know it's now it's you know, continuing, you know, you've seen these guys, they've always been fast, but now like even the combine, you know, the, the, the speed is just continuing to be, you think every time you watch the combine, you think, well, that that's one that's never going to be broken. And I then think the next worthy year, just broke it. Yeah. Didn't he? And then the next, the next year, some kid or some offensive lineman or some tight end, you know, sets the record again. And just the, the skill in which is happening and the improvement in the skill is just, uh, amazing, but you know the 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 style of play I think is significantly different. And now they're playing you know an additional game you know with seventeen. Uh, so I, I think some of those you know you see like during this time of of year you'll see so much um, comparisons between um, the current draft class and then the other guys, or even sometimes they even reach back you know twenty thirty years. Um, for a long, long time, it was always who the next Lawrence Taylor was, if you remember that. Yes. I that was always that. the yes, reference. This guy's the next Lawrence Taylor. And that's, that's subsided a little bit just because I think, you know, time separates you from that. Uh, but, you know, it was, a, it was a, a different sport. And those, those offensive skill guys were not protected, you know, 20 years ago um, to, the, to the capacity they are now. And I think that that probably leads to some un, um, unfair comparisons between the, you know, really the whole NFL up until probably year 2000, 2001. Yeah, for sure. So what do you think of your Titans, though? What do they need to do to kind of get back in that postseason run again? Oh, <laughs> boy. Uh, for me to give an opinion would be an uninformed opinion because I don't know. I, I don't I don't follow them enough. Um, you know, I root for them, but I couldn't tell you enough about that 
that uh, that roster to to give you any good feedback. Yeah, no worries. Well, what is the Cowboys now? I'm just joking. <laughs> well, I think everybody knows that roster, but nobody wants to talk about it unless you're in Dallas. But um, all right. Well, last thing though, what do you think of Super Bowl Fifty Eight? Did you think it was? Who were you rooting for to win that game? Oh boy, I didn't have a dog in that fight. Uh, you know, for me, I think it's just you know looking for competitive games and and uh, you know. And, I mean, I don't know if you could get a more competitive matchup than you had with overtime and, and kind of all the drama that went along with that, how the, the overtime rules rule, changed, um, yeah. has continued to change. Yeah. And I think that really put it back in a uh, in the forefront. Um, but I think the NFL has continued done a, a fantastic job of engaging uh, its fans, making a great product. Um, I think the, the, the players are as talented as they ever have been. And, and uh, you know, hopefully that just keeps going in the right direction and, and uh, you know the the consumers keep loving and keep loving the storylines and and uh, you know even your team you know it keeps you coming back every year you it know the heartache does. It definitely the does. heartache you, every year you're feeling it and you know and and uh, I say that tongue in cheek but you know the passion is there if you guys had won the Super Bowl or you had fallen short the the passion and and the and the opportunity to talk about the next year and the draft class just makes it uh, a year round. Um, you know, a year round passion. It really does. I mean, NFL, they're, you know, you talk about it all year, even though the season isn't a year long, right? Like you have the draft and then everything and all the trades and deadlines coming up. It just keeps everything exciting for sure. Yep. Yep. What you learn um, when you're in the locker room is you never want to get in the way of the NFL owners making money. That's the one thing. Doesn't matter their background on how they got to that that ownership, but they had to do something very, very special to have the, the, the means uh, to be able to do that. And I think what you've seen them continue to do is, you know, you break open and you get another wild or get another playoff spot. Now there's only one team that gets the buy, you know, the way they've set the calendar from, you know, the, uh, the, the Super Bowl going into the modified Pro Bowl, whatever that thing is now. <laughs> Flag <bubble>. um, yeah. <laughs> yes. All those different things, but you know, it's, it's something to, to talk about. Uh, and then you transition into made for TV NFL combine, which didn't happen 20 years ago. Right. Uh, and then taking the first round into prime time uh, on the draft to make it another uh, made for TV event. And that's a, you know, a three day event now. It, it didn't used to be like that. So they've done a fantastic job of, of continuing to, to understand that there is seemingly an un, uh, an unendless amount of um, attention that, that people will give and they've find new ways to, to, I guess, scratch the itch and give people the, uh, the product they want without having to play a game. They really do. Well, Peter, I appreciate you coming on all your accomplishments, telling us stuff. It was so interesting talking to you and I just appreciate you taking that time, but I do have one final question and okay. I, I do love that you didn't start till seventh grade. Cause I have a 12 year old son who is a, just loves football, his passion. Mm -hmm. He kind of dibble dabbled in some other sports, but he's starting, you know, school ball and this is kind of where it's getting serious. So what advice would you have for, you know, him and other kids that, you know, their dream is to one day play in the NFL? Well, uh, I would probably jump over the, the child and I'd probably go to the parents first um, because a kid is still just a kid. How you talk about it at home, you know, how much pressure you put on on a player. Uh, you know, if you put too much pressure on a kid, well, I want you to play quarterback. You know, I see, I see more parents hurt their children in the in the in the football uh, path than help them. There's, you know, it's, you know, the the parents get so involved that it becomes a we, and and there's obviously the the we part of it, but I think letting a young man you know, just kind of cut his teeth into it. And he's most, most players are not going to be really good when they start. And I think that's, that's just fine. And a lot of kids love football until the first time you get absolutely rocked. Right. And like, it feels like your teeth fell out of your mouth and like you, you, you don't know what hit you. And, and that's, that's a, that's a moment that everybody comes across at one moment uh, in their early career and it's either, shoot, oh, okay, okay, here we go, or, 
holy smokes. I don't ever want to do that. I'm never going to be the same. (laughs) Right. I'm never going to be the same. And then, you know, it's, uh, if you don't have a a solid temperament for violence and, and, and not necessarily doing to somebody else, but receiving it, it's going to be a tough, a, a tough battle for, for a young man. And I think that's where just let letting kids mature into what they are without all the pressure and the, um, you know, we got to get to your, your inside linebacker trainer coach and the kids in ninth grade. It's like, you know, let them go through puberty, you know, before we start, before we start, you know, training them and and putting his sole focus, because when you put your sole focus, anything as a young person that becomes your identity. And, and uh, sometimes those sole focuses, they don't play out the way everybody dreams them to be. And when you, when you make somebody one track, in my opinion, you start to tie their identity to it. And when they're young, if it doesn't go the way it should, I think that's a, that's a, um, a, a big challenge for, for people to overcome when something becomes your identity and it, and it doesn't go the way you wanted it to go. So my biggest, my biggest thing would be make sure like whatever the, the, uh, environment in that he's playing in, you know, in middle school, that at the end of the year, that that player wants to come back and do it the next year. That's great advice. Are you enjoying yourself? Let's do this next year. Because you can't want it more for them than they want it for themselves. I know that's a dead end. Right. Um, sometimes it, it's a it's a short term play um, with, you know, just, just hang in there and you love football and the kids like, I don't really love football, but you, you try to tell me I love football. So maybe I do love football, but, and then I'd probably go back to, you know, you started volleyball late, you said. Right. And I think football is a, is a talent sport, not necessarily a skill sport. And what I mean by that, I don't think you can make the the PGA tour if you're not playing golf by probably the age of six. Right. And investing 2 million muscle memory reps and all the competition and all those different things, tennis probably as well. Uh, it's a super repetitive skill um, where I think football is more of you have to acquire skill and you have to develop skill. But if you don't have the prerequisite talent, you can be as skilled as you want. But if you can't run fast enough to get open, it doesn't matter how skillful you are. Um, if you're a linebacker and you're not strong enough to tackle somebody it doesn't matter how um smart you are as a football player you have to have the the some necessary tools uh to play at whatever level you're at and i think you know a lot of the time when these young guys go in um, i didn't go through puberty till my junior year in high school my first all my first offer was going into my senior year of high school at that time that was pretty normal. Now, if I was recruiting somebody that didn't have any offers after their junior year, I would think there's something wrong with them. And I think that's a lone, that's a lonely spot to be in because some of these guys, if their parents didn't redshirt them or hold them back, you know, I, I, I jokingly say, you know, the kid was redshirted as a, as a kindergartner, you know, and they're, you know, the, the families are, are forecasting, you know, can I get him um, you know, cause you're doing the same thing. You're, can I get him physically mature a little bit ahead of the curve to maybe give him some different opportunities for the sport? Uh, but I think he's got to let the kids just enjoy him best, best you can keep him safe. Uh, try to surround him with good, uh, instruction, motivational instruction, guys that are good dudes to be around that, that, uh, aren't going to do silly drills to hurt him. And then ultimately, do you want to do it again next year? And if they say yes, then keep doing it. That's great advice. I love that perspective on it. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure talking with you, hearing about everything, and just listening to kind of your experience. So you're always welcome on the show. I'd love to have you on again, but I appreciate you being with us today. Well, thanks for having me on. I love talking about football. I love, uh, I really enjoyed, you know, I could, I could talk for 45 minutes just on that last, that last little bit of, you know, a parent, uh, parents have a young man that, that loves football or he's starting in football. What kind of guidance? Um, and I think that's, uh, I, I think we're so focused on, uh, we have to do 
we have to make a choice that, that we're not allowing kids to kind of enjoy some of the competitive spirit and kind of some of the competitive maturity that, that we all developed when the, the calendar changes and your uniform changes. You're not a one, you're not a one uniform person year round. And I think that I look back on, on my time as a, as a young kid thinking that was awesome. And I'm glad I didn't ever make a, a decision to be one sport in middle school or high school. Well, that's awesome. I, I feel your passion and I, the university of California is lucky to have you as a coach. Cause I can see the way that you care about your kids. So that's awesome. Well, uh, I appreciate your time and, uh, thank you for, uh, inviting me and, and uh, allowing me to uh, spend some time with you. Of course. Thank you. And good luck next season and take care. All right. All right. Goodbye. Bye. That was Peter Sermon, former linebacker for Tennessee Titans. We appreciate him coming on the show and sharing his journey with us. Stay tuned for more exciting guests in the off season with Lacey's lineup. Until then, your girl is signing off.